we've opened up into a new collection of knowing who we are in Christ. I want to know how to be complete in Christ. And how do I be complete in Christ? I think in a world where our identity is being questioned, our identity is being attacked. In fact, culture has their identity kind of confused. I mean, we're arguing for long periods of time on gender, that there's more than two. That's confusion. There's arguments not just on gender between male and female when it comes to identity. There's identity crisis when it comes to our calling, when it comes to our purpose, when it comes to our gifts, when it comes to how I'm going to be used in ministry. There's this identity that is being attacked all around, even in the body. I love the amens. So I receive the amens. It's an identity issue. In Genesis, we're going to open up into Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to talk a little bit about Abraham. Abraham, that renamed, got renamed to Abraham. But I, I just want to go a little bit deeper when it comes to identity. Because what I thought was, okay, I just got to be complete in Christ, and my identity comes from Jesus. We all know that. We all know that our identity is found in him. Now, what this collection of talks is going to do is really allow us to elaborate on what our true identity in Christ is. I want to know my true identity and I want to get a little bit deeper. Like I know my identity is supposed to be in Christ. I, I understand that. But what is the truth about my identity in Christ? Can I just encourage y'all that tr what's true and what's truth are different. I want to know the truth. I don't want to just know what's true. Let me give you an example. It might have been true that you went to church for a long, long time in your life and you served and you were with God. That was true in one season. But how about this next season, right? Truth abides forever. Truth is the word of God. It lives and abides forever. That's truth. Truth is his mercies are brand new every single day. That's truth. Truth is knowing that the weapon might be formed, but it won't prosper. That's truth. So there's a difference between what is true and what's truth. It might have been true that you were messed up in one season and you hurt a lot of people and you've done all these crazy things that family members and friends want to bring you back into this present moment. They want to take your past into this present moment. That might have been true in one season. But the truth in this season is that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. This is truth. These are kingdom principles that I have access to when I can just really believe and lean on it. This is truth. So let's talk back into identity. There's an identity crisis happening not just in the body of Christ, there's an identity crisis that is happening in the world. Now, identity crisis versus identity Christ is my rock. There's a difference. I'm no longer, because we're getting attacked, the identity crisis versus the identity Christ is my strong tower. Christ is my Prince of Peace. There's a difference between what is true and what is truth? I was looking up what identity means. Identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. I know it's kind of a little, it's a little deep, okay? But I believe my identity influences my behavior. I believe my identity influences my character. And I looked up what that word character means. Character is the way someone thinks, feels, and behaves. So my character is how I think, it's how I feel, and it's how I behave. So my identity influences my character. My identity influences how I think, how I feel, and how I behave. There's an identity crisis that is going on. And I, I went a little bit deeper. Y'all know me. I, I like the deep things of God. 
We search, it is the spirit that searches the deep things of God. I looked up, how do I overcome identity theft? So if you are getting attacked by identity theft, there is a process to be able to recover your identity from being stolen by a hater. By somebody that is trying to impersonate you, because that's what the enemy does, to try to take what is yours using your identity. Five steps on this, and I'm just going to share it. So what are the steps of recovering your identity? identity? Number one is you got to file a claim. <laughs> you file a claim to a company. A claim is just a case. When we are getting attacked, our identities are getting attacked, you know what we need to understand? We need to know how to say there is a case that is being presented because my identity is being attacked. If you don't think your identity is being attacked, you're not going to file a case. What is the enemy's job? To kill so that he may steal, so that he may destroy. But when my identity is in him, I may live that life abundantly, right? Identity. When I'm getting attacked, I must file a case. So let's file the claim. Let's file the case. That's, that's the first part. The second part is you got to notify the companies around you. Notify your credit company. Notify your banking company. Notify the companies around that, hey, my identity has been stolen. Some of us, we got to just give a notice to the devil that I'm God's, that I'm a child of the Lord. Some of us got to give notice to certain things in order for us to take authority and dominion. Notify the companies. The third part is you got to contact your local police department. Again, these are steps I saw on like just an article on what can I do once I, I'm being attacked by identity theft. What should I do and what can I do? Step three is I got to contact my local police department. I must contact my local police department. When we figure out that we're getting attacked by the enemy, we have to arrest. I have to arrest the, the, the devil. When you arrest something or when you arrest someone, you are placing them into custody where they're not just going to be free anymore. They're not going to be free mingling in your marriage. They're not going to be free mingling in your household. They're not going to be free just coming in. I got to arrest the devil. I'm arresting him in Jesus' name, but you have the authority in the spiritual realm to do that. I arrest every assignment of the enemy. So you got to contact your local police uh, department and probably file another report. I'm talking spiritual things up in here. There's a physical plan on when identity theft comes, but there's also a spiritual plan and a game plan, a strategy that God has given us. Family, this is a war move against the gates of hell. Number four, freeze your credit. Freeze your credit. The revelation that I got, because when you get your identity stolen, is, it says you got to freeze all your credit so they can't use your credit. I think some of us give the devil too much credit. I think he's running around with your whole credit line. He's running your credit and he's running it till the credit limit is over. We give him too much credit. The devil did this, the devil did that, the devil did that. What about the blood of Jesus? What about what Jesus did on the cross? Some of us got to freeze the credit of who we're giving credit to if it ain't God. Number five, the last thing is to scan for unauthorized charges in your bank accounts, in your bank statements, in your credit statements. Scan for unauthorized charges. There are some unauthorized charges you have done because of your hurt. There are some unauthorized charges you might have said to your spouse who is not the enemy. But there is an enemy that is within that marriage, within that household, that is trying to divide. That is the assignment. So are there some charges that I put into my account that allowed the spirit of division to win? 
we're getting deeper. Because these are all the playbooks of the enemy to try to attack our identity. That's good. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. So yes, we're, we might be going through an identity crisis. But I got to know the truth. My identity in Christ is. You guys, you guys get the wordplay? My identity in Christ is he is my firm foundation. He is my rock. He is my strong tower. He is my prince of peace. Let me just be real with y'all. You'll know that this ain't for God, from God if it's in exchange for your peace. If you have to exchange your peace in order for that situation to be peaceful, it might not be from God. Because God will not allow you to exchange your peace. You should have peace when the storm is hitting the territory. There should be peace in the midst of it, no matter what's going on. But once you exchange your peace for something, you can already discern it might not be from the Lord. Now, there's a difference from knowing that I'm being pruned, but I'm still peaceful. That's why we have to have a relationship with God, because when I'm being pruned, I should still have peace in the pruning. There's toxic relationships that are being cut off. I didn't get the promotion because God said, I'm protecting you from toxic managers and coworkers that are going to hurt you. So I had to cut that promotion up. But wait, I got something better. So it's trusting God even during a season of pruning. But, but God, you, you promised he was from you. You promised this job was from you. I moved to this city just for that. No, you moved to this city so that God can allow you to minister to something else, to someone else, to be in a different place, a different environment. Because if God showed you you're going to go here, once you got to this city, you would be like, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. That don't got my name on it. But when there's promotion attached to getting to that city, that next place, you're like, I'm going to do that. And what God does, it says, okay, I got you here, but this is really where I wanted you to go. If God showed you what it took to get to the vision he gave you, you would be like, no, Lord, I ain't doing it. You had to go through that, through that bump, through that hole, block that wall, go through that wall. You have to do all that. The moment you, that's why God doesn't give you the full plan. If he gave it all to you, you'd be like, no, give it to the next person. I ain't going through all that mess just to get what is really mine. That is God's. But that's why he only gives you the next step. And he says, trust in him through those steps. And our identity is being attacked through these. Am I supposed to be here? Am I worthy, God? Is this really me? This is what God does. But as we go into the story of Abraham, Abraham, we're going to see so many different things that he did that does not get culture's approval. Culture will not approve of the moves that the kingdom ordains in my heart. They'll never. In fact, they'll never understand it. They won't see it because only God can give you the vision. Why do we continue to try to get people to understand a vision that God didn't give you and God didn't give them? So I'm telling this person about a God vision, but they never got it. And sometimes I don't understand others. That's why we don't lean on our understanding. We just pray that if God really gave it to them, pray God covers them, pray God, pray God does the pruning, the protection, the preservation, because I might not always understand what another person has to go through in order to get to where God wants them to go to. Well, welcome to Abraham's story. We're gonna, this is gonna be a, a quick teaching session on just Abraham. Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12. Let me just give y'all seven keys. Uh, seven, or let's go characteristics. Seven characteristics of Abraham. When it comes to identity. Okay, I'm going through a lens of identity and I'm really praying that the Holy Spirit, oh God, I just pray that you would just reveal what you need to reveal to us. I pray that we would soften our hearts, that we would humble ourselves before you, God, that it is not me that is speaking. Holy Spirit, let it be you. 
And whatever you need us to hear, we don't want to hear the natural. We want to hear the spiritual. So Father, have your way. I plead the blood of Jesus over this because what you're about to reveal to us, God, will unlock doors, opportunities, blessing, and most importantly, peace in our life. In Jesus' name. Number one, the first characteristic of moving in identity is you must leave from familiar to journey into unfamiliar. You must leave from familiar to journey into unfamiliar. And a lot of religious and church folks, they'll be like, well, that's not how we used to do it growing up. Well, it's a new generation, honey. It's a new generation, sis. It's a new generation, bro. The Holy Spirit's going to move different. That house's mantle is different than this house's mantle. And this is why I love the body of Christ, because when I see how other churches are moving, I praise the Lord for the mantle that, they're, that God has given them, but also the mantle that they're pursuing. Because it's only God given. So what is the mantle God has on our individual life and in our life as a family? Well, here comes Abraham in verse 1, Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. That verse alone, it's saying your environment is going to shift. If you're going to follow God's calling and be identified by Christ, you will leave a familiar land, familiar territory to journey into places that don't make sense in the natural. It never will. And I, don't, I see a lot of different stories in the Bible that never made sense naturally, physically. So he's like, Abraham, everything you got, everything you're doing, leave that known territory, leave that comfortable place, leave that country that you were raised up in into a territory that I've ordained, that I've blessed you with, that is gonna have your name on it, that will bless many nations. And he, he says that right here in verse two, I will make you, a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I read this in another version and it said, Abraham, I will make you a blessing to others and I will make you famous. I, and make your name great. Can I just tell y'all, fame without blessing others is a curse. So if somebody's fame does not bless other people, it might not be from God, it's poison, it's toxic, and it's accursed. So y'all will know now when you see famous people, is it blessing other people in Jesus' name? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Make your name famous and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and you and all your families of the earth shall be blessed. So what did Abraham do? He left. I mean, that's all I got to do. I, I, I got no other choice. When God tells me to move, I move into the right environments, into the right house. I cut off from the past. I cut off from toxic things. I cut off because there's no growth there. And if I want to be a blessing to others, God, thank you for blessing me. But my blessing comes with obedience into how I move. In these last days, a true relationship with the Holy Spirit, getting into your word every day. Now, it's so great that we're in church, but this church ain't going to save y'all. I love being in the house of God. I love being here to gather and hear a word from God. But this isn't what's going to save us. Jesus is, and that's why we encourage a relationship with him. I pray this encourages us as well. Amen. Let's skip over to Genesis 13. So number one is leave from familiar to, to journey into the unfamiliar. Number two, number two is separation. Separation. Don't allow your separation to be confused with loneliness. Don't allow your separation to be confused with singleness. Separation is hard sometimes. Elijah had to separate 
from a kingdom that he was serving under because they were building altars for Baal and because the king married a witch, okay? Ahab, Jezebel. So he got into this separating. He said, I don't care where I go. The Lord will provide. Let's go to the brook. Wherever it is, it just ain't here. Separation, Genesis 13. Lot is pretty much the nephew of Abraham, okay? Genesis 13, verse 1, Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Remember, Lot was pretty much the nephew, right? So verse 2, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. If the Bible tells you you're rich in physical assets, you're rich, okay? So he's not just rich spiritually, He's rich. Why? Because he has a lot of livestock, silver, and gold. This, this is all going to play, play and make more sense as we continue to open up. Verse 3, And he went on in his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, and to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called out on the name of the Lord. Lot also. We went with Abraham, Abraham and had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able, this is it, verse 6. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. There's environments that you've been in covenant with people that aren't going to support y'all anymore. Lot and Abraham were in a land that wasn't able to support them. Both had their own things going on. Both had their own, you could say armies going on, their own resources. This land was not supposed to, was not going to support them any longer. Abraham was like, okay, Lord, what shall we do? What's going on? He inquired of the Lord and the Lord spoke. Verse seven, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and parasites that then dwelt in the land. This is amazing because we are able to discern when you're about to outgrow and a, and a place isn't supporting you anymore. There's too much strife. There's war and strife to the point where it's not even healthy. Like I get it, there's times where it's, we come together and we disagree to agree or agree to disagree. But in this case, we ain't agreeing on nothing. So what's going to happen? It's time to separate. Okay. And it's not just them, it's even the enemy, the Canaanites and the parasites that dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. I'm going to give you all some more wisdom on this. Let, let me just finish up verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it, is, it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Saddam and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zor. Woo. Can I just encourage y'all how Abraham negotiated? He said, hey, bro, you go ahead and choose. Go left or go right. Whichever one you don't take, you go, and I'll go the opposite. Sometimes us, we're like, mine, give me, give me. No, that's me first. And then we're, we're arguing about the first. That's why we talk baby talk. But we're not babes up in here. We're growing up as adults. What is the language of a baby? Mine, me, mine, give me, right? Abraham didn't have the language of a baby. What did he say? Please separate from me. Verse 9. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Choose, bro. It's up to you. So guess what Lot chose? What most people will choose? What my enemies will choose? What most of culture will choose? They will choose the land that looks good. Little did he know the land that looked good that he dwelt in was the same land that he got into captivity from the enemy. Saddam and Gomorrah. And that's the thing. People look on the outside of things. They see, oh, I don't want that. And they're so, let me just say it, picky. Ooh, I don't know about that. There's a little crack. I don't want that room. 
Oh, you know that property right there? Mm -mm. Not me. Never been me, not me. But I'd rather go to that one. It's beautiful. It's green. It's be it, it even says right here, and Lot lifted his eyes in verse 10 and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. The natural man wants well watered everywhere type of environment that look good physically. He's like, yep, that's me. That's it. Even though I'm about to get into captivity from it, right? Before the Lord destroyed Saddam and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zor, this is where you were like, yeah, you got to look with your eyes. Look with your spiritual eyes. Because physically, we tend to go, yep, that looks better. Let's move. Instead of like, wait, let me wait on the Lord. Instead, Abraham had wisdom and said, wherever you go, just go. Because this is what I'm going to promise you. God will bless him wherever he goes. And we're going to learn this. When you know your identity, God will bless you wherever. But it wasn't Abraham saying, no, you know what, bro? I want that because it looks good. Get out the way. Right? Because sometimes we do that. Oh my gosh, did I make a wrong move? No, trust where God is taking you and whatever you got to do to separate. That was a peaceful separation, by the way. It was like, I'll give you the authority and power, so go ahead. All right, <laughs> I'm over here. Number two, separation. Number three, see God. When we talk about these characteristics of seeing it through God's perspective and also identity, see God. Let me show you in verse 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated him from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, south, wherever you go, whatever you see, I'm giving it to you, Abraham. Because he's not playing this competition. He's not playing this game of like, what if I lose out? Timing thing. He's just peace. And then God spoke, but God has to speak it. God spoke and said, hey, that's, that's your blessing right there. I'm not attached to it, but I'm grateful for it. When I become too attached to accessories, it becomes idolatry. So it's just like, God, wherever you want me, I already left everything. I already left my land. I'm, I'm already out here. I was just with Lot. He told us to separate. This, this environment doesn't support us anymore. Now I'm looking and God's like, yeah, what you see, that's yours and you're going to be blessed. Number four, a consistent covenant with God. A consistent covenant with God. Meaning, wherever you go, as long as you have a consistent covenant with the Lord, to be in covenant with someone or something, anything, just means you're in agreement with it. So you could be in covenant with other relationships and they don't even have to be your spouse. You've built a covenant because you guys have agreed on witchcraft. And you don't even know it's witchcraft. But it's, you've agreed on new age teaching, new age thinking. But you don't know because on the outside, it looks pretty. Well, pastor, there's verses slapped on top of it. It has to be from God. But you've made covenant to believe it and to agree with it. And when you're in covenant with things, you start to live those things. Because you agree with those things. Because my character is how I behave. My character is how I feel. My identity influences my character. My identity influences my behavior. Consistent covenant with God. Go to verse 18 in chapter 13. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there for the Lord. Build godly, godly altars, family. Build godly altars. When you become in covenant to anything, it could be anything, y'all. Nowadays, everything is spiritual. The moment someone tells you it's not spiritual is the moment the, the devil is really attacking that thing. To deceive you to think that it's not spiritual. Whatever I agree with, whatever I build a covenant with, I start to build an altar for that. So I'm either building godly altars or ungodly altars. So number four is a consistent covenant with God. Number five, wise war moves. These are characteristics of Abraham. Wise war moves. Why would I go to war 
with a stick that will break if I just smack it in two? If I could just go to war with a sword that's sharpened. Some of us go to war in the spirit with a stick. Nothing else. Thinking you're going to attack a full-time devil that studies the Bible more than the average Christian. So he will use his trickery, his cunningness to deceive us, to render us helpless. And we go to battle with a stick. But I want wise war moves. Genesis 14, verse 14. Now when Abraham, by the way, this is when Lot got into captivity. <laughs> so the enemy took him over already, okay? So what is he going to do? He's going to go and help his little bro. Okay? Verse 14. Now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them uh, against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the woman and the people. Abraham knew how to go to war. Abraham knew how to take what his what is his with his own resources. The moment we start to think we don't have resources to go against the devil, we have the resources, we have the source, and we have to be called to be resourceful. When I'm full of him, I'm full of resources because I'm full of the source. Identity. Wise war moves. Number six. Only God's blessing. Take only God's blessing. Take only God's blessing. Family, this is strategy. Because some of y'all are carrying curses into your own territory. Some of y'all are carrying curses in a form of a thought. And what that thought does is it allows you to speak a curse. Because death and life is in the power of the tongue. That this tongue will either bless or curse. So you might be like, I, I threw away a bird, all, my ins all, the all the witchcraft. What about the thoughts that aren't from God? Because those thoughts can carry curses that allows me to either bless or curse my children. Bless or curse my situation. Bless or curse my finances. Bless or curse my marriage. Bless or curse my future spouse. He ain't never going to bring it, so I'm going to be alone. Just do it. You know, it's like you're cursing your own situation. That's what the enemy wants. Only take God's blessing. Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. This is after they've won and taken it all. Verse 21. Now the king of Saddam said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the, the, the king of Saddam, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. And that I will not take anything that is yours. Lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. He's like, I'm only taking what's mine and what we got. But everything else is yours. Some of us think we need that person's approval. You don't need that person's name on the least. Because if it was really yours, it's yours. You don't need to be sharing covenant and, and, and covenant with demons in contracts. And he also says right here, I have made, unless you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Some of us are invent investing into other people. Some of us are even investing into mentors, right? And they want your story when God is supposed to get the glory. They want it. And you're going to see these people that want it. He's like, and Abraham's like, no, I ain't touching that because you're going to be the, you're going to tell me that I'm the, you're the reason why I'm rich. No, I'm rich because of God. I'm rich with livestock and silver and gold and cattle because of him. So I'm not going to take what you have because I'm not going to allow you to use it to spread lies about what's God's and what's not yours. Because you're going to try to mix it up. And that's what people do in our situations. Well, I told you, sis. I told you, bro. 
I told you they were toxic. You told them they were toxic and now you're still, you're still gossiping about them and their relationship at the family parties. And once they get delivered out of that toxic relationship, you want to be the Superman. You want to be the hero. Discern these type of people that want to bless you, but really that blessing is a curse so that they could put their name on you. It's real. Only take God's blessing. Last one, number seven, as we're going into these characteristics, faith that hears. Faith that hears. I know I'm skipping over, but in Genesis 22, this is where we all know this story. Abraham, he, his, his name is Abraham at this point. He got, he got the name change. And I looked up what Abraham was. It's a father of a multitude. Abraham just means father of a multitude. Abraham means exalted father. So there was this name change that Abraham went through. And this is the point where he gets tested by his son. The son that he prayed into, right? His second son, which should have been his only son, but he ended up being what? Impatient. So the, the maid's baby became the baby mama. Right? <laughs> because of impatience. But guess what happened? God still blessed both. God still blessed both, even though I've messed up. And I don't want us to come in thinking like, oh, I messed up. Is God going to curse this? No. Repentance. Let that process go. And God would bless. God saw his faith and saw Abraham's heart. In Genesis 22, I just want to highlight a few keys in here. This is when he's going on to the mountain. It, Genesis 22 Verse 5, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. I'm going to skip over to verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And verse 11 was right before he was about to sacrifice his son because he wanted to be obedient to God. But he heard an angel. But before this, did you guys just hear what Abraham spoke? Let me just say, let's just share it. Stay here with the donkey, verse 5. The lad and I will go yonder and worship right here. And we will come back to you. So knowing that he had to sacrifice his son, he knew they were going to come back, both of them. He didn't know how. He just said, I'm, I'm, I'm being obedient to God. I'm just being obedient to where I need to be. And he heard. He heard the angel. And the angel said, hey, yo, it's, the sacrifice is over there. We see your faith. We see that you fear God. God bless you. And actually, the scripture said that Abraham was tested. So if you want to increase your faith, just know that your faith will be tested. The seventh characteristic is faith that hears. Let me just read these. Number one, characteristics of Abraham from a lens of identity. You must leave the fr from familiar to journey into unfamiliar. Number two is separation. Number three is see God. Number four is consistent covenant with God. Number five, wise war moves. Six, take only God's blessing. Seven, faith that hears. I want to kind of transition into being able to understand the enemy's strategies. Being able to understand the enemy's tactics. How do we do that? I have three things right here. Number one, understand language. Understand language. Because what the enemy is going to do is he's going to take Bible to twist his language to get to you. And if he can't get to you, he will get to people that can get to you. We see that. Understand language. The language that comes from, for example, lack. Okay? You know when it's a language of lack or a thought process of lack, it ain't from God. That's not him. Okay? Language. But here's another, let me, let me give you guys another lens of language. 
When a family or, fr or friend questions your identity. When a family or friend questions your situation, your relationships, what you, and they'll also come in a form of what? Lack. What you don't have that attacks your identity. You know what I see these from friends and family? It is a psychological attack. This is a war move from the, from the gates of hell. It is a psychological attack against us. Questions from friends and family that produce lack-like thinking is a psychological attack from the gates of hell. And we don't see it because it's like, oh, it's nothing. That's just, just how it is. That's just how they are. Understand language. Understand language. I was looking at language too. Language is not just what is spoken to me. Language is also what I hear. What I hear. I, I want to be able to have faith that hears. But I want to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit. What is of God and what is not of God. But I also look at this. So ear is how I hear. And I looked at hear and I looked at also the word what? Heart. Heart. If you actually take out the first and the last letter, the middle is ear. So something about my heart that hears through my ears. That's why we're called to guard this thing. So when I'm, the way that I understand language also enters my heart because of what I hear through my ear. Family, as we learn how to guard our hearts, but also as we learn to discern language, like, okay, that's an attack from the devil. I can't receive that. I'll listen, but I'm not going to receive. That's why I tell y'all, you can love thy enemies, but learning how to love thy enemies from a distance is also wisdom. Understand language. The enemy will use language to try to get you to do things. We see this in the beginning with the garden. What in Genesis 3, what was the question? Eve got attacked. Her identity got attacked. If you eat of that tree, if you eat of it, you're going to be like God and you're going to know the things of God. You know what questions come when that statement comes my way? What? You're telling me that God didn't give me enough? That God didn't make me enough? Yeah, because if you eat of it, you will be like God and know the things of God. You're missing out that God, well, the things that God knows because you didn't eat from this. So you're missing out. So when these questions or attacks come, we have to understand and learn the language that, oh man, that ain't God. Because it's making me feel like I'm not complete in him. Understand language, family. The second thing is check your vision. Check your vision. While Lot saw it was all green, Abraham said, wherever you want me, Lord, and then, he's, and then God spoke to him and said, look up, and what you see is yours. What I see, as long as God spoke it, that's mine. Check your vision. Check your vision. Because remember, confusion blurs discernment. So when I'm confused, my, my vision gets blurred. Check your sight. We walk by faith. And we just talked about the ear, understanding what I hear, understanding language. Faith comes by hearing. But when the enemy attacks what I see, it brings what? Doubt. Because my situation does not look like Bible. My situation doesn't look like the glory. My situation, it says be fruitful and multiply, but I, I don't feel like I'm being fruitful and multiplying right now. But my vision, it's what's going to carry me through those valleys. Check your vision. Because what if God, where you're at right now, is exactly where he needed you to be? What if sometimes he allowed you to hit rock bottom so that you know he is the rock at the bottom? Check your vision. I have to understand my situation and my perspective, but not even my own perspective. I'm seeing it through my perspective. What's God's? God, what do you want? Third thing is tongue confessions. Again, war moves from the enemy. Understand language, check your vision, check what you see, but also tongue confessions. 
Because everything I hear and everything I see and everything I'm believing is eventually what I'm going to be speaking. That's not just going to be the language I'm receiving. That's going to be the language I'm putting out there. Tongue confessions. Israelites in the wilderness cursing because of their complaining. Complaining causes curses. Complaining causes curses. This is why we have to be, if y'all know, I mean, Pastor shared this yesterday during Bible study. We're launching, go 31 days in this month. Just be grateful. If you're about to complain, just think of what you're grateful for and just watch your life shift. Watch your life change. You'll just have a lot more energy that you didn't know. You thought you needed energy from the energy drink. You just needed to not be an energy vampire. You needed to be an energy empire. Because of what I'm speaking. Tongue confessions. Complaining. Did y'all know that worrying is your flesh praying? So when I'm worrying, my flesh is praying. Oh, this, it's your flesh praying. That ain't the spirit. So I got to crucify those types of prayers from the flesh. Speaking. Tongue confessions. Let's go to uh, Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. I got a couple more verses for, for us today. Before we go into Matthew, because I'm going to close out in Matthew, let's actually, let's just go to Hebrews. I just want to read this to y'all just so we can have, because uh, we just talked about all of Abraham right now. So I, I really want to be able to, to read this. Hebrews chapter 11. Go to verse 8. It is impossible to please God without faith. Faith comes by hearing. And by hearing God's word. So if we want more faith, the more of God's word I hear, the more my faith increases. That's why we have to continuously just get into his word. I believe in the practical and I believe in the private and I also believe in the public, the corporate. I believe there's a healthy balance. It's kind of like having lunch by yourself because you ain't got no one else to have lunch with when you're eating. But also, why do you think families that eat together more often usually stay together? There's something about eating together spiritually in our diet, but also eating alone spiritually in our diet. There's personal re revelation and there's corporate revelations that get poured out. I need a balanced diet in how I receive. I'm just going to read Hebrews 11, just because we read all this. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he could receive an inheritance. And he went out knowing, not knowing where he was going. Family, we're not always going to know where we're going. But as long as it's God, it might be good. But if it's good, it might not always be God. Verse 9, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the hairs with him with the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore i'm gonna skip over to verse 17 by faith abraham when he was tested offered up isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son Y'all see the correlation between God the Father and Abraham, the father of faith, giving up their only thing, their sons. Verse 18, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. 
concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. There's a lineage right there. There's so much meat in just studying just that lineage. Matthew 16. We'll go here and then we're going to close out in one psalm. Matthew chapter 16. We're talking about coming back to identity. And I think as we open up this collections on identity and really it's a new month. So I, I was like, this is it, Lord. Number seven, this is the, the seventh month of the year. Number seven is what complete. So I got to find my completion in Christ. So as we go into these next few weeks, we're going to be secure and complete. Secure and single, and maybe later down the line, ready to mingle, right? But I got to be single and secure. I got to be complete in Christ. I got to find completion and even people in marriages, in relationships. Torment comes. Attacks come. When you allow the other person to be the center of your peace, to be the center of, well, as long as we're together and we're good and they do what I want them to do, we'll be okay. No, God needs to be in the center of that thing. He will make whatever storms are going on say, peace, be still. And I've seen that it's, you know, it's, it's this thing where you're, relationship becomes an idol the other person becomes an idol these things become idols in our life but just being complete in christ and i think it starts off with understanding identity who i am gifts purpose calling what i'm carrying that's all based on my identity matthew 16 verse 13 this is between the disciples and Jesus. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? As we're exploring identity, we must know Jesus. Our first service was a lot about knowing Jesus and discerning the real Jesus, okay? Just because they proclaim and shout Jesus doesn't mean it's him. I have to know for myself. Not what pastor told me, not what podcast told me, not what prophet told me, not what the pamphlet told me. Okay? Verse 14, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. A lot of people are going to have so many reasons or so many answers to who Jesus is. He was like that, like that. There's religions that believe he's a prophet. All these other things. Verse 15, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? See, God is asking us, who do you believe and say that he is? Who he, he is to you is how you're going to operate in your environment, in your life. Because it's a perspective that flesh and blood cannot give us. Nobody else can give us this revelation. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're my Lord and Savior. You're Jesus. Not the Jesus of those people that try to give him a chance and are looking for some way, somehow to not give Jesus a chance anymore. They got church hurt by a man, so that's what dictates their relationship with God. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now we start to identify who Jesus is and search who he really is. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the great shepherd. 
17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one he was the Christ. You have to know who Jesus is. And then you have authority over the enemy. Y'all know that? Like, that's where when our eyes be enlightened, we have authority to be able to overcome the gates of hell. We have authority. And then it says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell. And then what? I'm going to give you some keys. There are some keys that I have access to. These are kingdom, kingdom accessories that I got access to. But my Father that is up in heaven is how it's going to reveal. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Check this in verse 21. I want to read this. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised by the third day. He's sharing the will of God to his own disciples. Verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you and me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. This is a disciple of Jesus. Experienced miracles, signs, wonders, saw the glory, and also confessed Jesus as Lord and as the Son of the living God. A few verses. Rebukes him. And he gets rebuked right back. See, it's interesting how like in church, we want when we're trying to find our identity. We love when God blesses us when it comes to identity. But when I'm out of line and I get rebuked, I never want to go to that church again. Because I got rebuked when I was speaking against God's will. We love blessings, but when rebuking comes, the church hurts me. I'm hurt by them. These people don't care about me. They blessed me, but when they're correcting me or I'm getting rebuked off God's will, I'm hurt. Remember I shared this past week, some of us, McDonald's messes up our orders a hundred times and we still go back. The church messes you up or takes one thing wrong, one wrong thing. You ain't never going back. But we can give these franchises another chance, but we can't give God a chance. The thing about God is he's never given up on us. How do we know that? Because of what he did at the cross. He never gave up. What if he did? The blood would have shed. Would the Holy Spirit have came? When we have all this dominion and power, do we still have to sacrifice goats physically every year and wait one time during a traditional celebration every year for a priest to come before us and forgive us of our sins? Or can we just thank God what he already did on the cross and right after this service or even right now? I could just say, Lord, I ask for forgiveness. I repent because of the blood you did. I don't have to sacrifice my animal at home. Because that's what they had to do. This is the God that we serve. I'm thankful I live in this testament. Because there's an old testament. You know, testament just means covenant. There is an old covenant. I'm living in the new covenant because I'm a new person in Christ. And it's actually a lot easier than back then. Thank you, Lord, for systems. Thank you, Lord, for leverage. Thank you, God, for allowing me to have apps that can save my time. Thank you, God, that I don't have to walk 20 minutes or 30 minutes to get to a grocery store. I can get into a thing that I put gas into and I just press one button and I just move it. I don't even know how the engine works. I just get from one place to another within a few minutes. Thank God. This is the generation we live in. To be able to share the good news. To be able to share the gospel. I'm closing out because you guys know I like keys when I close out. On these things around identity. 
when you're pursuing your identity, there are things that you're going to have to go by in order to be able to allow God to mold you. I look like at a, at a puzzle piece. When pieces of God are missing in the one that created me as the puzzle, not, I'm, not, I'm never going to see it, but until I put it all together, I'm like, oh, that's what it was supposed to look like. Y'all ever get a puzzle, figure out what was that? And you, that was the very first piece you found and it was the last piece you put on? How could I not figure that? It was the very first one you saw. I think about God as like that puzzle piece and that's how I try to figure out that identity. I believe God reveals our identity in him every day. But once you start to really know confidence, boldness, you're going to say yes to God and no to the devil way more often. You're going to say no a lot more in your life when you know who you are, when you know your worth, when you know what you carry. When you know what you're marked by, what you're anointed with, and what you carry, you're not just going to go anywhere anymore. You're not just going to be any, any time. You're not out here just to kill time right? It's not going to be like that because there's purpose. There's strategy. There's a vision. There's greater things that I could be doing with my life that is more fulfilling than just kicking it with some homies on a Thursday night, on Thursday, th Thirsty Thursdays, just to kill time because we want to wake up and it to be Friday already, right? The only thing I thirst for is the one that when I drink from it, I shall never Thirst again. Yeah, yeah, y'all know I love doing that. Five keys. Matthew 16, verse 24. Let me just read this and then we're going to go into the five keys closing out. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. I don't know about y'all, but I've already put a down payment on a mansion in heaven because of my works. My name is in, in heaven. All right? So I'm not talking or preaching a work type of salvation. Do you, bro? Yeah? Go ahead. You can inherit the shack. Or you can inherit something even greater in heaven. That's what fires me up. Like my down payment is for my eternity, not my temporary. Show me the verse. We just read the verse. Verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. I'm going to open up your Google calendar for your whole life here on earth, and I'm going to look at all your tasks that got checked, that is being invested into a spiritual bank account. What keys are you getting access to in the eternal. I, 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 think I, got, I think I got more than just one man. I think I got a couple. God, you know my heart. You know my labor. I'm in the middle of escrow with one of the properties right now in heaven. Right? It's happening. But I want more. Because it's eternity. It's eternity, family. These five keys on identity. Number one is you have to learn to lose yourself. Jesus just says here, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We have a generation right now that is confused. Again, they're arguing about how many genders there are. They're confused when it comes to how to actually identify themselves, but also they're confused in discovering. Discovering, discovering who? Discovering God. Some of them are so prideful that they have to come up with an answer right? To every question because they want to be like God. They're not looking for answers that have already been given to God's children. They're trying to look for answers to and, and solutions. 
You know what the Bible says? Having a form of godliness, but denying his power. That's what these prideful people have. They just give you an answer from culture, from what their experience, from what they've learned, from what they've watched on how to catch a cheater. They're giving you relationship advice from people that cheated on other people. Don't do that. Don't do this. But they don't go to the Bible for it. The word of God on it. You got to, in order to find yourself, you have to find God. Find God, lose yourself, and then you'll find your life in him. It's, it's an interesting type of paradigm or perspective, but it's Bible. Doesn't always make sense, but I, Lord, if it's from you, I'm taking it. Number two, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And we just saw that with Abra Abraham. It's okay if it's uncomfortable. Some things are shaken off. Some things are just being let go. You're being worked on. Your mind's being renewed. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not from God. When you're uncomfortable, thank God for the comforter. When you're uncomfortable, thank God for the Holy Spirit. This is why it says, as I decrease, he must increase. When it's less of me, it's more of him. When it's less of my worldly desires, it becomes more of God's covenant, agreement, and the things of God. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Number three, believe the blood strategy. Believe the blood strategy. When it comes to identity, I might be under attack, but I'm under the blood. Believe the blood strategy. The blood of who? Jesus. That this deceiver that is here to deceive the whole world, this is Revelation 12, the dragon, the, that great dragon, the serpent of the old, who comes and his assignment is to deceive the whole world. The only way I can over, overcome him is through the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. Let me go a little bit deeper on the blood of the lamb because let's talk about even the lion. I got to know how to be loving, humble, and sensitive like a loving lion or lamb, like Jesus, submissive and obedient. But I also got to know when I step into situations, when to rebuke a demon and be a lion. So there's this balance of what it takes to become a kingdom-minded person in strategizing to go to war against the enemy. Sometimes I want to rebuke their error because I told you so. But sometimes I got to be a lamb and just listen and be obedient to what they're saying so I know how to help them. No lamb talk and lion talk. Okay? Believe the blood strategy. Number four, trust the unfamiliar. A lot of what we're going to be doing as believers is a lot of things around us, environments are going to be unfamiliar. The way the Holy Spirit's going to move in me and through me and other people, it's going to be unfamiliar. I, you know, a lot of people in church, they base their, their, their doctrine off experience only. Experience, basing your belief off experience is not wrong. It's just not 100% complete. Like I can take experience and discern, but I still, still got to take God's word. I got to get understanding, revelation, and I'll take, but a lot of people debate, well, I've never heard anybody speak in tongues my whole life. I've been in ministry for 30, 40, 50 years, and I've never seen that, so it doesn't work. It's real, right? Well, no one does that. I've never seen that. I've been in church for a very, very long time. No, you, you've been in religion for a very, very long time. Did you, y'all know that the father of lies, the devil, he is the head of religion. He is the head. And what's interesting about that is the spirit of religion, religion hates the Holy Spirit. It does not like the Holy Spirit because it exposes religion and it exposes its, its tactics. So trust the unfamiliar. Ah, this is too much. I don't know. I'm not used to this. That's fine if you're not uh, used to it as long as you're not getting abused by it. Okay? That's a good one right there. Never allow your peace to be an exchange for what you think somebody else's peace is going to be. Because they're not going to have peace, true peace. It's just going to be, to me, it's like temporary happiness. It's kind of like giving a baby just a little 
you know, pacifier. But really, they're hungry. Y'all get that? That's what we do sometimes in exchange for our own peace. We have to prescribe what the real issue is. If they're hungry, feed them. Don't just shut them up with a bass of our feed them. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Number five, not just because there's a lot of babies in here. I love all the babies. God bless them all. We're dedicating, dedicating them in Jesus' name. Number, last one, number five, as we close out today, sensitivity to your environments. When identity is being vulnerable and when my identity is being revealed, I have to be sensitive to the environments I'm going to. Why? Because <laughs> my, my, my environments will try to break me when I'm vulnerable. When somebody's a little bit vulnerable and they're kind of like, uh, you, you'll, you'll take anything. And this is why sometimes you don't need to go out there on a Friday night. You need to stay in and let God pour into you because you're open, you're vulnerable, you're authentic and whatever you hear. That's why when you're fasting, you're not at the bar. It doesn't make sense, right? It's like you're, you're oh, I'm in the spirit though, but you got all bunch of devils around you. Come on, take this, do that, music bump. And it's like all your, but all your senses are heightened when you're fasting. So you're vulnerable and you're going you're gonna to receive a lot more. And in those environments that I'm sensitive in, I also want to be able to discern secondhand re relationships. Some of us are in secondhand relate, secondhand smoking is what it is. When you get into an environment where you're not the host, but you are the one that's around the host. You're around some secondhand relationships that even though you were in that environment, it's kind of like going to a barbecue. You didn't cook the barbecue, you didn't eat the barbecue, but you go home and you smell like the barbecue. That's what secondhand relationships do in our life. They make us smell like something we didn't even say I'm in covenant in, but I was in that environment and you know what's interesting about what parasites like to do suck on the host so when a host is consumed with toxic things parasites are on that host and what that host does is it breeds incense into that environment so be sensitive because sometimes you just never know what you're around and whose smell is on your shirt? You ever get home and you're like, dude, you smell like, you smell like Korean barbecue. I wasn't even there. I couldn't afford it. I was just with my friends talking. I was hungry, but I come home to save money. But you smell like the place you were just in, like you consumed it, you ate it. I couldn't. That's what people do when they go into these environments thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to be like them, do like them. You already got that secondhand relationship with them. So be sensitive to the environments that you're in because these things also form our identity. How I feel, what I see, what I think, what I do. And it reminds me closing out on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they got tossed into the fire, they came out not smelling like fire. I was going to bring a glove, but I couldn't find one. I want to be the one of those guys that had a, you know, a little demonstration. Because I think there's some visual learner. I learned the visual learners. What that glove does is whatever you touch when you have the glove on, you take it off and you're still clean. Your hands are still clean. That's what it reminds me when I put on the full armor. That's what I, it reminds me when I put on and put on Christ, have a mind that's Christ. That's what it reminds me that no matter what I touch, as long as I'm in Christ, I might be, and that's the thing. I'm not telling you to not go into toxic environments. I'm telling you to go to environments that God has appointed you for, assigned you for. If I'm not assigned or appointed, I'm not going because God's hand isn't over me. And sometimes we believe, and there's people that believe they're called to go, you're not called to go. God's hand's not over it. That's why I have to be led by God to get into these places even though my heart is to win souls. But you, you, you need to work on you sometimes. 
Praise the Lord. Learn to lose yourself. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Believe the blood strategy. Trust the unfamiliar and sensitivity to your environments. I believe that we're going to be really be set free. I don't know what God has going into this new collection of like identity and being complete in Christ, but I know that we're just going to be so bold that we're not going to need other people's presence to feel fulfilled. Because I've been there. I've done that. I, I've understood. I've got, I went to places just so I can feel like I'm worthy, just to feel like I'm fitting in. Accepted is a good word. But what if the shoe doesn't fit? Well, here's the strategy. Go find a new shoe. If the shoe doesn't fit, I'm not going to force it. I'm going to go look for a new place. I'm going to look for new relationships. I'm going to look for new environments. I'm going to look for places and shoes that actually fit the season that I'm in. Don't allow your peace to be a doubt payment for someone that's in exchange willing to torture you. Because when your peace is the down payment, torment may be the exchange. We're going to learn a lot because I don't know what's attacking your identity and I don't know what's attacking who God has called you to be. But I pray that that thing be lifted off. And I pray we really know who we are. And I pray that we have so much confidence in Christ that wherever we go, I don't have to preach or drown somebody with a Bible verse to feel like I'm worthy. Like, I feel like we get into conversations and tell people our whole testimony, our whole story. We write a whole book right in front of somebody that actually is hurting and they need help. They don't need my testimony. Testimony is to get them to glory who Jesus is. But I'm here to listen to the hurt person. I get it. You might be broken and hurt too. But I promise you, God is going to bless God is going to fulfill. God is going to sustain you. Because God paid it all. He paid it all on the cross. I once heard, Lord, they got us paid bills down here, but you paid it all on the cross 2,000 years ago. Why am I still paying bills? But I'm also going to proclaim truth. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. Put it on his bill. Give him the credit. Freeze your credit account. If you're giving the devil too much credit, honor your heart. And no, I'm giving credit to the king of kings. Your identity is found in, in him.